Greetings from quarantine land. I didn't expect to ring in the new year cooped up with COVID. My wife and I both tested positive this week, so we get to be Rona roommates. And uh, if I'm going to be cooped up with someone having the plague, I'm at least glad it's her. She's pretty cool. I love her. Thank you for your prayers for Katie and for me. So far, we're hanging in there. Here's hoping I look and sound a little better than I feel. Honestly, I cleaned up for you, okay? I sort of tried to look somewhat presentable. I'm coming to you from the most elaborate state-of-the-art sound studio in my house, the bathroom. Just to be perfectly clear, this is a desk chair I'm sitting on, so don't get any ideas. You know, I always thought I sounded better singing in the shower. I'm not sure I'll sound better preaching in the bathroom, but here we are. Here we are at the new year. The new year is traditionally a time for reflection. The last few months of 2021 saw some good things come for me and my family, and it felt like it was long overdue. Some of Katie's chronic health problems have gotten a little better under control, and, and I recently got a new job. That's exciting, except a week into the job, I contract COVID, and huh, it's made it a little more complicated. But on the whole, at least in our little world, 2021 ended on an up note, except for the corona thing. At least 2021 was better than the raging dumpster fire that was 2020. So here's hoping that 2022 isn't like 2020 two, you know, 2020 part two, that's not what we want. That's a bad joke. I'm sorry, but we always enter the new year hoping it will be better than last year. It's a big tradition in our culture to talk about how the new year will be better and especially how we will be better in the new year. New year, new me. We hear that all the time. Okay, sure. Yeah. I think we've all said that. And who doesn't love the idea of being a better person for like four days and your New Year's resolutions wear off? New Year, new me is a lovely sentiment, but after a little while, it's more like New Year, new meh. New Year, new meh. I thought it worked. I don't know. Maybe someone else will think it's funny. I know that's not a good attitude. <laughs> Maybe it's just the, the Rona talking. I'm not feeling so great right now. But the struggle is real this time of year, isn't it? We start out the year with such high hopes that, that this year is going to be different, that we are going to be different in this new year, and then we have to deal with the same old stuff. True and lasting personal change is rarely quick or easy. Think about it. If we spend a lifetime programming our brain to react in a certain way, way to certain circumstances, then it's really going to take something drastic to truly make us different in our responses to the world. So here's where we get some good news. If you really want to see lasting positive change in your life, that's what Jesus is here for. Jesus came to make us truly something new. The Apostle Paul explained this concept to the believers in Ephesus a long time ago, and he wrote a very long letter. We have that preserved in the New Testament as the epistle to the Ephesians. He, he framed it as the old man and the new man, the old person we used to be and the new person we're becoming the life we're leaving behind, and the life that we are stepping into. When you trust Jesus as your Savior, and that's the biggest thing you need to do in this new year if you haven't, when you trust Jesus as your Savior, you become something brand new instantly. But it doesn't stop there. Salvation is only the beginning. Then begins sanctification. That's the big fancy word for the continual process of being transformed. Your, your attitudes and your behaviors and your thoughts are becoming more and more in line with Jesus. The life of a follower of Jesus is 
meant to be a constant process of shedding the old and putting on the new. So I'm thinking I am going to do this old school Bible study style. And uh, if you've, uh, we're going to do Ephesians chapter four. Okay. If you want to grab just like a paper Bible, if you've got one, uh, you can, you can go ahead and grab it. You know, I'm not going anywhere. I'm, I'm here in quarantine. I'm literally confined to two rooms of my house. So uh, thank you for your prayers. Uh, Katie is a few days ahead of me in the recovery. And, and frankly, she's a lot tougher than me. So I think she's going to be sprung out of here before, uh, before I am. I'm, I'm so grateful that she has done okay. A lot of you know her health history has been very difficult. And, and I, was, I was worried that, that she wouldn't do well. But she is one tough cookie. So you got that Bible? All right, great, great. Let's find Ephesians chapter 4, verses 17 through 24. And uh, we'll just take it a little bit at a time. But first, let, let's take a second to pray. Oh, Father in heaven, mm, I pray you'll open up our hearts to hear from you. Pray you'll give us a burning desire to be something new in this new year, not new from the outside in, but from the inside out. And I pray you'll give me some strength to share this message you put on my heart in Jesus' name. Amen. So here we go. You ready? Verse 17. And it reads like this. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk. Ah, okay. Walk. He says walk. Walking is a major metaphor in the New Testament. The life of a Jesus follower is often described as a journey. You get the picture here. Walking, following, a journey. Forward progress is strongly implied. Long before this Jesus life was called Christianity, it was called the way. From the beginning, it was understood to be something more than a box that you check, more than a label that you wear. Following Jesus is a way of life. Paul tells us that a Jesus follower should not walk like the Gentiles. What's a Gentile? Well, in the usual sense, a Gentile is a term, a term that applies to anyone who isn't Jewish. And I'm going to guess that's most of us. Paul isn't using the term in this context to indicate ethnicity, but spiritual alignment. Here in Ephesians 4, a Gentile is a person who doesn't claim to be a follower of Jesus. In other words, uh, an unbeliever or, or someone who's not a Christian, someone who doesn't say they're a Christian, not, not making any spiritual claims along those lines. So what Paul is saying is, if you know Jesus... You can't keep living your life like people who don't know Jesus. Well, that's simple enough. Jesus followers should live like they're following Jesus, following his example. Live like they know him. A saved person shouldn't live like a lost person. And if you're, if you're a believer, your life should be noticeably different than the people who aren't. And unfortunately, hmm, we don't always live up to that. Sorry to say that includes me. Pretty much all of my biggest regrets in life have been from times when my walk was more of a stumble. Man, there's, there's some things I wish I could go back and change, but life doesn't work that way, does it? Paul told the Ephesian believers they should no longer walk like people who don't know Jesus. No longer. That implies that they were saved, but their walk wasn't always matching their profession. And it was time for them to choose to walk differently. They needed to live their life differently. We can't change the past, but we do have the power to change the future. This is your encouragement for today. Every time you choose to live for Jesus, instead of going along with the ways of the world, it changes your future, at least a little. And enough Good decisions, even if they're small, adds up to big change, lasting change. 
Paul elaborates a bit more in the verses that follow. So we'll pick up in the middle of verse 17. He says, you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over to lewdness to work all uncleanness with greediness. Oh man, Paul, he doesn't sugarcoat anything, does he? He says that if you're trying to navigate your way through life without Jesus, you do so in futility of mind with understanding darkened. Mm, gotta love Paul. He has zero chill. If he lived in 2022, he would be canceled in a second. We live in heartbreaking times, don't we? People chase after things that only bring them physical, mental, and spiritual pain. They pursue lifestyles that are ultimately destructive. But if you name it for what it is, you get canceled. People don't like the idea of any desire being called sinful. Their assumption, of course, is that if it is a desire that they have, it must be a good thing. And that being able to pursue that desire equals freedom. Ah, it just doesn't work that way. Some desires have a way of taking over. When you pursue the kind of desires that God warns us against, be sure that they will slowly take control. Maybe you start out in control. But eventually, you become the one that is being controlled. And once you go so far down that road, ooh, it's hard to ever go back. We get a reminder of this every new year, don't we? We all have habits we would like to break. I don't know if you make official New Year's resolutions, but most of us start out the new year hoping for something better, hoping to break some habits, make some new habits. And most of our New Year's resolutions don't make it halfway through January. Why is that? It's because once we've behaved a certain way for so long, it's really hard to change it, even if we desperately want change. You see, that desire that we have been indulging for so long hijacks our life in a way that it's very difficult to wrestle back the control. But so long as we want to change, there's hope. The Lord can set you free from anything if you cry out to him. It may take some time, but he can bring that change. The bigger problem comes when you don't want to change. When it doesn't bother your conscience any longer to, to do things that the Lord says are, are going to hurt you, that are bad or wrong. And, you know, he doesn't call things sinful just because he's up in heaven and he's a stuffy old guy. He doesn't want to have any want anyone to have any fun. No, the Lord tells us to avoid certain behaviors because they will be destructive and harmful to us physically, mentally, spiritually. And the proof is right there. Look around our society. Self-harm is rampant and it's not always just things like cutting or, or drug abuse. It's everywhere. Paul says you can get so far down that road of indulging something that's bad for you that you can go beyond feeling, that um, you're no longer able to fight the destructive behavior, but, but revel in it and celebrate it. <laughs> We're seeing what happens when a whole culture rejects the truth so long that they cannot even even tolerate the slightest mention of the truth. People poison their own cup. And if anybody tries to warn them, they accuse them of, of being a hater, being evil. I know it's discouraging. I know if you're a believer trying to do the right thing in this world, you, you, just, you just really want to get through to people. And unfortunately, it probably won't do that much good to argue with a blind person that something doesn't look right. And it probably won't work too well to tell a person who is numb that something doesn't feel right. Mark Twain once said, it's easier to fool people 
than to convince them they've been fooled. But here's what you can do. Live your life for Jesus. Pray that the light of the Lord will break through the darkness that keeps people blind and numb. Don't give up on talking to the people you care about. Just understand that you and your logic, you're not going to be able to break through that. But the Holy Spirit can. Rely on the Holy Spirit to help you when you're, when you're witnessing to people, when you're trying to point people away from destruction. So, hey, let's finish out the text here. And let's remember... There's only one person on the planet whose behavior we can control, and that's difficult enough, and that person is ourselves. So right now, let's, let's get back down. It's, let's not just concentrate on someone else who needs to change. No, 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 no. Jesus said, don't worry so much about the speck that's in your brother's eye. You need to worry about the beam that's in your own eye. So let's get to verse 20 here. But you have not so learned Christ, he says, if you have been... If, if indeed you have heard him and been taught by him as the truth in Jesus, is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man which grows corrupt according to deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. If we have heard Jesus, if his truth is in us, then it should show. We should be changing. The old nature should become something new. Does it mean we'll instantly be stripped of all our bad habits? I wish. You wish. The people who live with you in your house wish that all your bad habits would go away as soon as you surrender to Jesus. But no, it's more of a process. It's a process of, of taking off and putting on. Taking off the old, putting on the new. Paul uses really interesting imagery here. He says, take off the old man and put on the new man. There's a certain way of looking at that. It almost sounds like you're putting on a new set of skin, and that sounds kind of creepy. But there's a subset of people who, for whom the, the concept of changing skin isn't so creepy. And these people are video gamers. In many video games, you can completely change the appearance of your character just by by making a different selection in a menu. They, they call these different designs skins, and they'll have them for different times of the year or, or have a, a skin that you know looks like something or someone famous or someone from another video game. And it's all a lot of fun. It's just easy. You can change your skin that quick, but the, the abilities and the qualities of the character are just the same. It's only the appearance that changes. Is that what Paul's talking about here? Is he talking about changing the outside appearance in hopes that someone will think we're different? Well, people sometimes assume that's what this Jesus stuff is about. Getting your life cleaned up. Getting yourself some religion so you can appear respectable. But real change has to begin much deeper. We don't just need a new skin. We need a new heart. That's what Jesus does. He puts a new heart in us. We don't change the outside in hopes that people will believe there's something different on the inside. That's the way of the world. The way of Jesus is when he works in your heart and the inside heart change begins to show on the outside. Maybe the reason our New Year's resolutions so often falter is because we usually try to work from the outside in. Real and lasting change more often happens from the inside out. You've got to have the not only the outward behavior change, but the motivation that comes from within that is bigger than ourselves. Verse 24 says, the new person we're meant to be isn't just the result of our own effort. It is created by God. We must be renewed in the spirit of our minds. As we go into this new year, I, I think it's great to make some resolutions. You should make some resolutions. You should desire some positive change. Absolutely. But remember, you know, every, every positive change begins with some kind of a decision that you want things to be different than they are now. But I do encourage you to look at it from another angle. See 2022 as one part of the bigger transformation that God wants to bring in your life. It begins when you trust in Jesus and ask him to renew 
your mind. And uh, let's just do that now. Let's just pray right now. Heavenly Father, I want to pray with anyone who is receiving this message, who needs to trust in Jesus and be saved. I pray that they would call out to you and confess their sins and ask to be made new. Lord, we believe that Jesus is the Son of God. We believe he came to earth and lived among us and gave his life and rose again that we might have eternal life in you. God, we pray for that new life that comes through him. And I pray in Jesus' name that you would be continually working inside me, making me new. God, help me to shed the old and put on the new in 2022. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, guys, <laughs> um, I don't think I've ever preached a full message, you know, in a in a in quarant I know I have it in quarantine. I don't not sure I've preached in a bathroom before, but here here we are. Hopefully it works. And uh, love you guys. I hope we get to be back in person soon. We have this uh, post holiday surge of COVID going on, so there is some chance. The next message you get from me will be a video message, but we will be back in person just as soon as possible. God bless you all. Love you. Miss you. Can't wait to see you in 2022. See you.